We are going through the book of Revelation, and I am so excited about it. I don't know if you guys have been enjoying it, but I've been actually loving it. And, uh, and I got the privilege of getting to preach on the Antichrist. Yay. <laughs> but um, one of the things that uh, a few months ago in October, Nate and I had the privilege of going to Africa, and uh, we got to go to Ethiopia and then to South Sudan. And we're going to pray for South Sudan because they are just in a total mess right now. Whenever light invades darkness, you expect a kickback. And there's been over 18,000 people that have come to know Christ since we planted those churches there. But so we're in, we're in Ethiopia, and... and uh, and part of the training we're there, there's uh, over 300 pastors, and our job, Nate and I's job, and several other pastors, is to train these pastors to go into unreached villages, to preach the gospel, to see cities won, the light to change, or the dark to change into light. And, um, and so we're there, and one of the guys, our interpreter, our last day, his name was Derenji. And Derenji comes up to me and he says, Pastor Bob, Pastor Bob, he goes, Pastor Bob, would you please pray for me? And I said, well, of course, what can I pray for you? And, and he says, listen, he, he goes, that I would have courage and I wouldn't fail Jesus. And I'm like, that's like asking the cowardly lion for courage. And I said, yes, I'll pray for you. He says, well, what's going on? And he says, well, three years ago, I, I decided God called me to be a pastor. And I came to this training and now, he goes, my very first time I went into a all Muslim village. My wife and my two kids. And when they go sent out as pastors, they are literally handed a Bible, a towel, and $100, and told to go to the unreached world. Sounds very familiar, Jesus' command, right? And when they walk into a village, he just starts open air preaching. He starts preaching Jesus is God, Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is the only way for your sins to be forgiven, and Jesus is the way to be reconciled with God. All Muslim village. Men rose up from the village to see the weirdo. And they grabbed their machetes, and they grabbed their swords, and they grabbed their stones, and they came out, as Derenji's preaching, they started clobbering him. And, and he drops. And they start stoning him as he's on the ground. And there's blood everywhere. And they think he's dead. They think he's dead. And all of a sudden, he rises back up. And he starts preaching Jesus again. And then they arrest him. And they throw him in jail. And as we get ready to study the story about the Antichrist, it looks like the church is dead. It looks like the Antichrist is winning. But it will rise. And it will proclaim. And it will have victory. So Derenji gets arrested. He is thrown in jail. And he says, Pastor Bob, jail is not like it is in America. They feed you here. <laughs> and, and he says, and they beat you every day. And they say, deny Jesus. And he goes, I wouldn't. And he says, but Jesus visited me in prison. When a man has scars on his head and scars on his shoulders and he says Jesus visited him, I believe him. And then he says, Jesus says, do not be afraid, take courage. And that's the message for today. Do not be afraid of the message of the Antichrist, but take courage. And then, and then Jesus tells him, he says, read the Quran. A strange strategy, right? He says, but that's why we're studying the Antichrist today. We study our enemy. See, Muslims aren't our enemy. Things that deny Jesus as Lord is our enemy. And, and, and so he says, study the Quran. So he starts studying the Quran. And as he studied the Quran, he says, he sees in the Quran, it says that Muslims are supposed to read the Bible. And, and, and then when he gets to that part, Jesus shows up again. So he gets two visits in his three months. And, and, and Jesus says, now I want you to go into the mosque. And he goes, I want you to pray with them. So they do their five prayers a day. And, and, uh, and he, you know, this is just mind-blowing to him. He says, no, stop. Whatever you're doing, I want you to write this down. If we just ended it right here, if the rapture happened and we were taken, 
this is the most important thing you guys are gonna learn today. He said, this is what Jesus told him. He says, pray in my name. He says, when you pray in my name, it diffuses all darkness. And so as we start studying the Antichrist and you see all this darkness and hopelessness, we pray in Jesus' name. We pray in his name because the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. And, and, then, and, then, it, and then he got to, gets out, he goes into the mosque and he starts praying, he starts praying in the name of Jesus and pretty soon after, like any church service, they start talking and stuff and he says, hey, you wanna come over to my house? We'll study the Quran. And they get to that part, you're supposed to study the word, the Bible. And they said, have you ever read the word? He's like, no, we've never even been able to see it. He goes, Dorenji goes, actually, I have one. Do you want to read? And so they start studying the word. And he says, then people started throwing the Quran away. And then he started a church. And right now he has 160 people going to his church in all Muslim village. And he just planted another one. He has 68. And the reason he was asking for me to pray, because he was training three other men to go into other mosques to tell them the darkness. When we study, Amen. <laughs> When we study the Antichrist and his works, we can be fearful or we can be bold and go into the areas of darkness. Because where light exists, darkness cannot. And the devil will come to destroy you. That is a promise. And sometimes he looks like he wins. But I tell you, even when he doesn't, it says in Daniel 7, this is a, a vision that Daniel has that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he couldn't interpret and, and he sees this and, and it says the Antichrist, the beast, has control of all the earth and, and people are worshiping him and it's devouring him like iron teeth. It's devouring all the people. And it says, and he'd been given permission to have control over the saints. Pretty bad, Right? But he says at the exact same time, there was a court in heaven that was going on. And it was judging him, the Antichrist. And it says, and his time ended. And everything that he devoured was returned back to the saints. Is that the Antichrist will not win. It will look like it. It will look like the day that Derenji took a shot into the head. It looked like they were winning. But he does not win. If we get up and we proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord... We win. And so I want you to open your Bible to Revelation 13. And I'm just going to try to do my best to interpret it as the best a guy from Fruta can. So let's go ahead. <laughs> and he said, I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns, seven heads, and ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its head. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear, and its mouth was like a lion. And to... It, the dragon, gave his power, his throne, and great authority. And so um, let's just back up to verse 1, and he says, And I saw the beast rising from the sea. Now, some commentators say the sea is the sea of the Gentiles, that he'll actually rise from the Gentile nation, and land is usually associated with the Jewish nation. That's one interpretation. The other is the sea represents turbulent times when the world is in really troubled times. The Antichrist will come because he was the one who's going to come and bring peace to, it, to the world. And the other interpretation of the sea is actually from the Mediterranean area. And so what it is, I do not know. But I do know that he is going to come from the outside. It's not coming from the Jewish nation. And then it says, with ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems and horns. And then it says, looks like a leopard, looks like a bear, speaks like a lion. And this is really referring back to Daniel 7. And Daniel 7, as I referred earlier, is a dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon at the time, has, and he can't interpret it, and tries Daniel and says, interpret it or I kill everyone, right? And so he sees these horrible things, and he sees a leopard. He sees, sees this giant man, and he has characteristics of a leopard. He has characteristics of a bear, characteristics of a, a, a lion, and then he also has legs like steel or, or like iron. And, 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 then he, and then Daniel asks, what is this? And, and what God says, these are kingdoms. These are kingdoms. And so most interpreters believe that this, the, the leopard is the kingdom of Greece. Alexander the, Great, Alexander the Great was able to conquer the world very quickly. It's going to be fast. So when the Antichrist comes, he's going to conquer very quickly. And he's actually called in Daniel 7, the little horn. 
And he's going to rise up from a little unknown nation. He's going to rise up, and he says he's going to take over that nation, then three nations, then the ten, then the world. And it's going to be very quick. And then the bear represents the uh, Neo-Persia, the Persian Empire, and it's going to be all-powerful. And when the bear throws its arms down and crushes something, there's nothing more powerful than a bear sh strike. And it is going to have power over money. It is going to have power over military. It is going to have all control power. And then the last one is the lion, is that when a lion roars, there's nothing like a lion. He will have control of thoughts and power, and people will worship him. And when he speaks, people are afraid. And they say, who is like him? And so this is the Antichrist. And, um, and how that's all worked, the only two things I know for sure is that there's a beast, and he's the Antichrist, and the dragon's the devil. But he, there's, these are the characteristics. So in verse 3, I want to continue on. And it says, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So this Antichrist is going to have signs and wonders, and this is a direct mocking of our Lord, that Jesus died and rose from the dead, and so will the Antichrist. And ever the whole world will be, Wow. And then it says, and they worship the dragon, and they give in him his authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? This is a direct attack, mocking God again, out of Exodus 15, 11, when, they, when the Israelites had great victory, and they came through the Red Sea, and the people shout, who is like our God? Who can defeat our God? And so Satan is nothing but a counterfeiter, and he uses these words to mock God back. But he, these words are blasphemous to God. And it says, and Then the beast was given a mouth of uttering haughty and blasphemous words, which is prideful. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. So there is a limit to the Antichrist. And it's three and a half years. And it said it opened its mouth and uttered blasphemies against God. And it blasphemed his name, his dwelling, and those who dwell in heaven. He's just attacking the Ten Commandments right at the beginning. He's attacking God. He's attacking his holy name. There's, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And he's attacking his, um, the dwelling place in heaven. And the Antichrist has no fear of God. And that's why he's called the lawless one. And then he says, and he was also allowed to make war on the saints. And as I studied this, this is really, I, I, I can't believe that something would be so bold to insult God like this, but when I see the war on the saints, it really troubles me because I, I want to believe that God is going to have victory. And he says, and he conquered them. And the authority was given to every tribe, people, and language, and nation. See, this is much more than a, a little thing that's going on in Israel or a little thing that's going on in Europe. It's the whole world because we're going to marvel at him. And it says, and then he says, and all who, on, all who dwell on earth will worship it, the beast. And everyone whose name is not written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. So the only ones who are going to resist worshiping the beast is those who have the seal. They're the only ones that are going to be able to withstand it and see for who it is. See, see, Jesus says in Mark 13, he says, there are many false Christs and false prophets, and it has the ability to deceive many, even the elect, if that was possible. So for some reason, the elect is going to have the ability to recognize the Antichrist. And then it says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. See, see, Jesus uses this phrase with the seven churches. So I, when Jesus says, those who have ears should hear, this would probably be a good thing. Go back, what does he want me to hear? See, he's just revealed the playbook. He's revealed, just like he did to Derenji in prison, there's a playbook. And, and it says, and, and Nate taught this last week, if you want to beat Satan, it's Revelation 12, 11, and he said they overcome him, by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and not even loving their life even unto death. And so, and then, and then he goes on to say, and if anyone is taken captive to ca captivity, he would go. And so he's telling you right now, you saints, 
And saints are, see, so many often people in the church say, you're just a sinner saved by grace. But the Bible calls you a saint. Your new identity is a saint. And he's encouraging the saints. He says, some of you are going to be in captivity, and captivity you should go. Dear Engie, you've got to go. He understood that. And he said, some of you are going to be slain by a sword, and slain you will be. But then he says, and it circle this in your Bible. He says, here's a call. So Jesus is saying, here's a call to you. My saints, my followers, here's a call. Call for endurance and faith of the saints. Is that we have to endure until the end. And we have to not lose our faith. And so, as I get ready to, you know, teach on this, there's just a couple things I want to cover is, who is the Antichrist? What is he like? And what will he do, and what are we to do with that? So, who is he? He's a counterfeiter, number one. The Antichrist is a counterfeit. And when you work for the Treasury Department or any bank, and you look for counterfeits, you never study the counterfeit. You study the original. But a counterfeit has to be close enough that the average person can't tell, right? So if I, if I took my dollar bill and I went and made a photocopy and tried to take it down to the convenience store, it's pretty obvious it's a counterfeit. And so I want to take a look at how, how similar the Antichrist tries to cover himself to be a false light like Christ. You know, Christ came and it was predicted through the Old Testament. Lots of prophecies about Christ, where he was going to be born, how he was going to die. Same with the Antichrist. Lots of prophecies, who he is, what his name is. Another thing is that Christ had an appointed time when he was to come, right? It says in Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time, God came and through his son, Jesus. And the, and the Antichrist says, in 2 Thessalonians 2, he says, in, in the time that was appointed to him, the Antichrist will come. And see, so, so often throughout church history, people are looking for the Antichrist. It's interesting because the Antichrist, is it, the time has not come yet. Though John, the Apostle John, says there are many Antichrists and they're among us right now. And he actually says there's a spirit of Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist is anyone who denies God and Jesus. Anyone who denies God and Jesus or Father and Jesus is actually the correct word, Father and Jesus, it has a spirit of the Antichrist. And so, and then it says, how the Antichrist and Jesus are similar is that Jesus was fully man. The Bible says the Antichrist will be fully man. But it also says that Jesus was more than man. He was God-man. And the Bible calls the Antichrist Superman in Psalms 50. He, he'll be more. He'll be able to do miraculous signs. Right? And, and he'll have the ability to deceive. And then it says, Jesus made a covenant with Israel. The Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel. It says, in Revelation 17, it says, Jesus is the King of Kings. And the Antichrist will be called the King of Kings. And then it says, Jesus' ministry was full of miracles. In Acts 2, it says, God approved Jesus through the acts of signs and wonders, through miracles. And then it says, Satan equipped the Antichrist, and it says, listen to this, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. That the, he will be able to do miraculous things. And people are like, obviously, he must be God. But they're lying wonders to deceive. And it says, Jesus' ministry was limited to three and a half years. So is the Antichrist. And it says, Jesus will be called the Prince of Peace. So will the Antichrist. Jesus is called the Morning Star. So is the Antichrist. And then it says, Jesus will be the object of universal worship. It says in Philippians 2.10, it says, all the knees will bow, every knee will bow and acknowledge him, right? And then it says what we just read in Revelation 13.4, it says, everyone on earth will worship the Antichrist. So I'm kind of tired of talking about the similarities because it is so blasphemous to even talk like that. I want to tell you how he's a fraud and, and what he really is. Because he needs to be revealed for what he is so we know. And he says, this is, he says, Jesus came from heaven. John 3. The Antichrist comes from the pit of hell. It says, 
Jesus came to do the Father's will. The Antichrist came to do his own will. It says, Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit at baptism, correct? He said he was filled with power when he came out. The Antichrist is powered by the devil, by the dragon, right? All power had been given to him. It says that Jesus submitted himself to God, and the Antichrist defies himself against God. And it says that Jesus came to cleanse the temple. The Antichrist will defile the temple. It says Jesus came to minister to the needy. The Antichrist steals from the needy. In Psalms 10, 8, 9, it says, and Jesus was rejected by man, but the Antichrist will be revered by man. And it says, Jesus was slain for all man. And the Antichrist will come to slay man. There is no similarity between these two. When we know the truth, it is as obvious as a real dollar bill and me photocopy. There is nothing of value in the Antichrist. And so in the Bible, it's interesting, the Bible doesn't always call people by their names, but by what they're like. Have you noticed that? Abram, you know, his father of, of, of many, and, and all of a sudden he has an encounter with God and he becomes Abraham, father of nations, even though he had no children. And, and it tells a story about Jacob. He was called the deceiver. Jacob literally means the deceiver. And, and then he wrestles with God and he gets his hip out of joint. And then God says, I no longer call you Jacob, but I call you Israel, one who wrestles with God. And then he takes a guy named Simon, who is, literally means the word means sand. His name means sand. And he says, no longer I call you Simon, I call you Peter the rock. The rock. And so names mean stuff to God. And we're always looking for the name. If you're at left behind, you think it's Nikolai Carpathia, right? As <laughs> soon as we find Nikolai Carpathia, we'll know it's him. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to know by what God calls him. There's over 50 names in the Bible for the Antichrist. And I'll, fortunately, I'm not going to go through all 50 because literally it just makes me sick. I'd rather our attention be on Jesus. But Jesus says to those who have ears here. And so we want to hear what he says. So the first thing that one of his names is the Antichrist, which means he came to undo all the work that Jesus did. Whatever Jesus is, he's the opposite. Um, you know, one of his names, Jesus' name is the truth. He's called the lie. And one of his names, he's the man of sin. He's the son of perdition. It, and, and then uh, Paul also writes, he's, like, he's the lawless one. He, he, he tries to undo, in Daniel 7, he says he tries to undo all laws. And Paul says, in these last days, you'll know it because what is good will be called wrong and what is wrong will be called good. And, and, and I'm telling you, church, if, the, if we could transport a church from 200 years ago and they would see what's going on in America in this world, they would be thoroughly convinced we are living in the last days. We are living in these days. But, it, but aren't you thankful for the word of God that gives us ears to hear and eyes to see? That, that there are truths, and we stand on these truths. And then it says, the beast. The beast is mentioned most often for the Antichrist. And it's mentioned over 30 times in the, uh, uh, in the New Testament. And literally, the Greek translation means wild beast. He's not tameable. He just does what he wants to do. And then he's the bloody, deceitful one. He's the superman. He's the en enemy. He's the adversary. He's the liar. He, all these characteristics describe who the Antichrist is. But it's interesting how he will come. It says in Revelation 6, 2, it says he will come on a white horse with no arrows. He comes as peace. He comes as peace. Jesus comes in a white horse. But he comes to redeem. And so, as we, uh, so we know who he is. We know what, he's, what he is like. But what's he going to do? Right? That's what we want to. And then as you read Revelation 13, there's really three W's. He, he has been given, he wants worship. He wants authority with words. And his last one, he, he wages war. And so in Revelation uh, uh, 13, it says that he's been given a mouth to speak. He's been given a mouth to speak blasphemous words. And he's the one who's going to defy the church. He's the one who's going to defy heaven. He's going to speak blasphemous words. And if, are we not living in those days now? Are we not? That if you speak truth, then you are told that you're a hate person. If you speak truth, you are told that you, uh, that you are narrow-minded. 
And then, then he's, he wants worship. See, Isaiah 14, 14 tells the story of how Satan rose and how he was cast from heaven. But it says in Isaiah 14, 14, he, I, he said, this is Satan. I will ascend above the heights and the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. He wants all the worship. Isaiah says, God will share his glory with no man. And when we, we, we worship the beast, it's blasphemous. And then finally, he's been given permission to war. And I love how Pastor Kirk teaches this. He says, we, we so often look at Revelation through American worldview, but the Antichrist is alive and well, and he's warring against the saints all over the world right now. Um, over the Christmas break, I've been reading this book called Jesus Freaks, and it's based off the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it just tells these stories of Christians who have been martyred. And one of the stories, um, this is in communist China, and uh, it's a story about they're an underground church and the pastor's captured. And he captures two, two little girls. The communists capture two little girls, a nine and 10 year old girl. And they bring them in and they beat them and they, and they, they say, recant Jesus. See, the Antichrist isn't always a person, but it's a spirit. He says, recant Jesus. And the girls say, we won't. And they beat them. But then they get a hold of the pastor and they beat him and they, and they deprive him and, and they finally say, Pastor, we will let you go. All you have to do is shoot the two girls. And the pastor agreed. So the pastor walks in the room, the soldier handed the, a pistol with two bullets and said, do it. And so the pastor walks up and the two girls are on their knees looking up at the pastor. I mean, that's really hard for me to say. There's a reason why Jesus says, give us faith in the ability to endure. And, 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 and the girls looked up and said, we forgive you. And they said, we thank you, pastor. It is an honor to suffer with Jesus. And, and they said, we thank you, pastor, that you taught us about Jesus. And the one girl speaks up and says, we thank you that you, you baptized us. That, that our sins were forgiven and we're in right standing with our Savior. And then the other girl says, and we thank you that you taught us about Holy Communion. Because it's not about bread and juice. It's about communion with a living God. And, and you, you taught us the holiness of communion. And these are just little girls. And, and, and he says, and the one girl says, Every saint has a dark day. <laughs> Is that not true? Every saint has a dark day. And the girl said, the older girl said, our prayer is that your dark day today will be more like Peter's than Judas. See, Peter has a dark day and he is redeemed and, and becomes the great Peter. Judas has a dark day and he hangs himself. We hold nothing against you. We pray forgiveness for you. And then he shot them. And it said his heart was hardened. And the moment he shot them, another gun was fired, shot him in the back of the head. See, the spirit of the Antichrist is a liar and a deceiver. See, when, you, when it says the whole world will worship him and they'll worship him because he, he has power over money and he has power over military, he has power over this. But when you start worshiping the Antichrist, it is only a moment of pleasure and an eternity of suffering. But when you choose Jesus Christ, it is a moment of suffering and an eternity of pleasure to be in presence of the living God, to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And so how, how do we know the story really happened with these two, right? Because the two guards that were in the room gave their life to Christ. And they became part of the underground church. Is that even in the darkest day, church, even when the church looked like it's defeated and it's been conquered, there is a courtroom in heaven that is judging this. There is a courtroom in heaven that is saying, no more. And I don't know when the day is coming. Well, when I, when I was in Ethiopia, 
And, uh, and we're training these crazy pastors and, and, uh, and um, Nate and I are teaching and, and, and I don't know about, it. I don't know if Nate's here, but um, Nate's a phenomenal teacher. And, and I, I was more proud of him when we were in Ethiopia He's just an amazing teacher and able to communicate the gospel to people who are really going out and risking their lives. And it was very humbling following him. And, uh, and so we, our first day, and, and, and we're teaching these 300 pastors, but at the exact same time in this village of 60,000 people, um, there is no medical, there is no doctors, there is no medicine, there is no water system, there is no power. It is just like a big giant campsite, but there's 60,000 people that live there. And there's a lot of sickness because of waterborne disease, sewer, things like that. And, but they have never had a doctor visit up there. And so there were three doctors from Denver, a surgeon, a internist, and a pediatrician, and about five nurses. And they opened a medical clinic. And, and they had 500 people. I don't know if you can show it. Um, but they had about 500 people show up the first day to see three doctors. And so in these rooms, and on the other side of the gate, you can't see them, but they go back so far. The very first room is the pharmacy, and uh, the third room is the prayer room, and you can't see the rest of the room. These are dirt floors with dirt walls and metal roofs, and they're doing surgeries in that, and there's so many people. It's really like the pool of Bethesda, and they're pushing to get in, and you literally have to step over people that are being carried with mats, and there's so many sickness and diseases, and they're touching you like, help me, help me. And you're just like, what do I have? And so, so that night after the first night of teaching and the first night of the doctors ministering, we're all sitting around a table and, and, and the doctors sharing their stories about the sick that they were able to help. And, and, uh, and uh, the pastors are t sharing about these amazing pastor stories. And, and then it finally came to me and they said, Bob, what do you do? What do you do? And everything in me wanted to say, well, I kind of pastor these two outdoor churches, or I, I, I belong, I'm an outreach pastor of this amazing church, or, and we get to feed thousands of people every week. And, but something welled up in me that I was no longer ashamed of what I really do, that I get to pray for the sick and see God heal, and I get to undo the work of the devil and cast out demons. And I said that, and these doctors looked at me like, you're cuckoo. <laughs> and, and, and a couple of the pastors looked at me like, you're cuckoo. But one pastor looked at me, and his name's Joel, and he says, do you really? And I said, yes, and I told him some of the healing stories we've seen. And then he says, can you teach me? And I said, I'd love to. And I spent about 45 minutes kind of ministering with him and, and prayed with him and laid hands on him. And, and, and he's like, that was amazing. Like, it's only amazing if we do it. <laughs> it's only amazing if we do it. <laughs> and, and, and so I said, well, there's about 500 people over there, about 100 yards from us, that really need God. So let's go. And he gets this pale look on his face, and I get a pale look on my face, like, what did I just say I'm going to do? <laughs> and so we walk to the blue building over there, and we're walking through the crowds, and we're in there, and, um, and they go to the the nurse's station, and then they go see the doctor, and the, the interpreters are with the nurses and the doctors, and they fill out a white card in English so they know what prescription to give them, and then they come to the prayer room. And so we have no interpreter. All we have is a white card, and the, this one girl, 14 years old, she comes in, and she, uh, it's, she's in there for stomach problems, distended stomach, diarrhea, all, all of it's a waterborne sickness. It, it, and they're, they're, once you've seen one, you've seen them all. They're all very sick because of the water. But it also said she's never spoke. And, and I said, Joel, I think God wants to heal her. And I think this is demonic. Now, did I hear God from that? Like, no. But I recognize the work of the devil. And so he says, really? And I'm like, yeah. And, and so he, uh, he starts praying. He says, in the name of Jesus, I tell this spirit to leave her right now. And all she did was make this little movement like this. Now, she doesn't speak a word of English. We don't have an interpreter. There ain't no, like, acting going on, you know, like where they fall down and, you know. It, it is just literally, we're praying by faith that God, you're going to do something. And I said, Joel, did you see that? And he's like, yeah. And I said, I think it's gone. 
He goes, what's going on? It. <laughs> and, and he goes, well, now what? And I said, well, tell her to speak. <laughs> and he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, tell her to speak. And he goes, okay. And so he goes, in the name of Jesus, I command you to speak. And, and he, he's of this denomination that likes to yell, so he's yelling. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> she can hear. She just can't talk. And, uh, <laughs> and so he says, he says, you will say Jesus is Lord. And the girl just looked at him and she goes, Jesus is Lord. And, and the mom just drops. And she's the girl, the 14 year old girl's grabbing her tongue like, ah, what was that? And the mom gets up and they start speaking their language. And Joel turns around and looks at me. He goes, did that just happen? And my mouth is so open from catching flies. Like, and I'm trying to act like all cool. Like, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> is that Jesus wants us to be equipped to do the stuff. And, on, and, and that is Pastor Kirk's vision for this church, is that to create disciples to reach the unreached. And that's why we do Wednesday night service here. And Nate is going through the book of John that you would understand who Jesus is. And that's why, you know, the middle school and the high school and the, the children's ministry, or, or that's why we have classes that go on Wednesday night. But on, this, on January 8th, we're starting a, a new thing I'm teaching over there on the movement is how do we prepare? Because in the nation of Ethiopia, seven years ago, they had a 3% population of Christians. When you equip saints who believe in the blood of the Lamb, not afraid of their testimony, and not afraid of their own life, Ethiopia is now 30% Christians. In seven years. Light is powerful in dark. And the kingdom of God will invade dark places. And we are not afraid of the Antichrist. He is defeated. He can only do what he's allowed to do. And our job is to go rescue those who are in darkness. And, I, and my job is, I'm believing that some of you are saying, like Joel, teach me. Teach me. And I know some of you are looking like, that's crazy talk. Because I would have. But I'm going to ask you to stand up right now. I'm going to invite the worship team up. And you know what? You know, I, I am so sick and tired about the names of the Antichrist. Are you guys tired of that? Yeah. yeah, it's actually kind of blasphemous to talk about him. But he gives us the playbook. And I would rather focus on the names of God. And so on the screen, these are just a few names that God has for himself. They're not liars. God is truth. It says that God is our creator, God is, our, God is sovereign, he is Lord, he's our provider, he sees all you, you need, he's our healer, he's our victory, he is holy, he's our peace, he's our deliverer, he's our shepherd, he's our father. And so, we'll never be able to become the church that they are in Ethiopia and like they are in South Sudan or they're like in Brazil, until we can start praying for each other and believe that the presence of God comes through you and that he says when two or more gather, he's with us. And so I'm going to ask you to do something really crazy. We're, going to, we're entering into 2014, and 2014 has got to be different than 2013 because we're in the last days. And I don't know when the last days are. Paul was thoroughly convinced it was right now. John was thoroughly convinced right now. But based on what's happening in the world right now, I'm thoroughly convinced it's right now. And, and I want a church that in Grand Valley, that a population, we have about 15% of Christians in Grand Valley that attend church. What would it be like in seven years from now that it was 70%? That God was so present in his holiness, a revival started, and I believe it's gonna start right here today. And I'm gonna ask you guys to break up into groups Oh, I know you guys are getting scared with that. Okay. I'm going to ask you to break up into groups of no more than five, six. And, and, and I want you to pray for one another. As you look at this list up here, there are names for God. Who do you need God to be in 2014? Who do you need God to be? Is he your provider? Is he your healer? 
Is he sovereign even in bad situations? Is he your comforter? And see, see, it says in Hebrews 10, don't forsake the gathering like many have, but it says to pray for one another, encourage one another. And it can't be just a classroom setting anymore, church. See, nothing happened with Joel when I prayed with him until we did it. And I believe that something's going to happen here, and I believe there are people who are going to hurt hearts, are going to be healed. We've seen miracles of the last service, miraculous stuff, and I believe the more God's going to do more of that. If he can loosen tongues in Africa, why can't he heal here? So that even includes you guys way in the back and way in the back. And so we're going to do the worship song at the end right now as you guys pray for one another. And I just want to, you're looking at these names for God, and we have a, uh, a bookmark that's in the bookstore. It's absolutely free, and it has all the names for God that you keep with you because it's easy to forget. It's easy to remember these things about the false God and forget the real God. So do we got it? So I want you to be so bold to say, my name is so-and-so, and I need God to be this. And if you want to get more detail, that would be great. If not, that's okay. But we're going to stand in agreement and believe God's going to work. Okay? So turn around, meet with some people, introduce, and we're going to worship.